back everyone to lecture number six of the bioinformatics course part two. Um, so we'll just continue. Primary metabolites. Um, so there are two types of metabolites in every organism. Primary metabolites is a metabolite involved in growth, development, reproduction, and the easiest way that I always remember if something is a primary metabolite or a second metabolite is just the very basic definition saying that if a primary metabolite is missing, it results in immediate death. That's it. So if it's required for functioning as a living organism, then it's a primary metabolite. Um, Examples are things like amino acids, nucleotides, antioxidants, and these kinds of things, right? If you don't have them, you more or less die immediately. Secondary metabolites, of course, are organic compounds that are not directly involved. And of course, a, a secondary metabolite does not result in immediate death. Um, things like cocaine, morphine, glucosinolates, penicillin, those are all secondary metabolites, which are found in humans, um, but if they are not there, um, then um, they don't result in immediate death. So, yeah, just some basic definitions. Um, and of course, there's knowing if something is a primary metabolite or a secondary metabolite can be very useful. Good. So, the interesting part, mass spectrometry. How do we determine which metabolites are in a sample. So there is mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry itself consists of four steps. The first step in mass spectrometry is the separation of compounds. The next step is the fragmentation and ionization of this compound. Then we have the separation of these fragments by their mass over charge ratio. And then the third part is the detection of the mass over charge ratio. So when we look at compound separation, we uh, can do that in three different ways. So the first way is to use liquid chromatography. We can use gas chromatography and we can use capillar electrophoresis. And these are LC, GC and CE. So if you read a paper and they say, well, we did um, LC um, electrospray um, TOF, then that means that they used liquid chromatography first to separate their compounds. Um, so, and, and, and always when you write down um, what kind of a mass spectrometry experiment you did, you mention the first three. So you can do LC, um, Maldi and then um, time of flight or you can do LC Maldi for ionization and then you can use a sector machine right so there's there's always three parts that when you write a paper you have to mention which three methods you use and generally people mention compound separation fragmentation and then the separation method that they used um, the detection is not part of the name of the method so when we talk about chromatography, so liquid or gas chromatography, uh, we already talked about this a little bit during the previous lecture, I think. Um, but this is when you um, have a compound. And again, I think I, I talked about this last time. A lot of people did this in uh, elementary school. So hey, you take a, a, a pen, like uh, one of these, you put a dot on a piece of paper and then you put this in a glass with water or in a glass with alcohol and had the the mixture that dissolves, uh, the, your mixture of compounds is dissolved in a fluid. This fluid is called the mobile phase, and then it is pulled through something which is a solid, which is called the stationary phase. And so here we see an example. So we have a solvent thing, we have the solvent, and we put three of these little dots on a piece of paper, and then have we wait, and after 10 minutes, and the, the solvent has gone up through the stationary phase and by going up it separates the dots so the the compound that you want to analyze uh, and uh, of course depending on what you use as a mobile phase if you use a liquid then you're doing liquid chromatography if you're using a gas then you're using gas chromatography capillar electrophoresis is a method in which um, you move um, uh, electrolyte solution, so a solution which has um, an intrinsic 
charge um, and you move those based on an electric field um, and then hey you, you can separate them according to the ionic mobility additionally they may be concentrated by means of gradients in conductivity and pH but hey, the basic thing about capillary electrophoresis is, is that you have a very small capillar so a very small tube with a hole in there um, inside of this tube there is a substance and the the substance that you want to separate is being fed into the tube and then pulled through the tube using electrophoresis, so using a electric field. So when we talk about fragmentation and ionization, there's different techniques on how to fragment the um, resulting um, well, not mixture anymore, because hey, you start off with a mixture, then you separate the mixture into the individual compounds using uh, chromatography or electrophoresis. And then afterwards, you have to do something to make them able to fly through your mass spectrometer, right? Because in a mass spectrometer, you, um, you, you analyze the mass over charge ratio. So you have to charge these things. So the first thing is, is um, uh, the first method to doing this is uh, hard ionization. So in hard ionization, you use a molecular electron bombardment, um, for example, using a filament. So if you think back about televisions before we had flat screen televisions and LCDs and stuff, uh, a television would be a massive like machine, right? So you would have the screen and then in the back of this screen there would be an, uh, a filament. So a little piece of, of metal which would be and where a large current would be put on and this, these, these, these electrons would then be attracted and they would fly because of an, uh, a, difference in, um, a difference in charge. I could actually make a little drawing of that but I don't think anyone's interested in me drawing because like it didn't go well last week with the uh, with the, the drawing. So, yeah, but hard ionization means that you have an electron beam. Yeah, so this is one of these molecules. Okay, so now I have to do a digital sketch. Um, what what do you want me to sketch? <laughs> We'll do this after this slide. Um, yeah, but um, first let me finish the slide and then you can say what kind of a sketch you want because I do need to have some inspiration of uh, what I'm going to draw. But yeah, so we have a filament um, and this filament um, produces electrons. So we have an electron beam. We have this parent molecule which comes out of, uh, which comes out of the out of the compound separation phase, so hemp, for example, through to capillary electrophoresis, this molecule is hit by the electron beam, and then what happens is, is that this molecule gets a charge. It not only gets a charge, because when we use an electron beam, we are doing hard ionization, right? So this electron beam also causes the molecule to more or less break apart, right? So we also get like little subfragments of the molecule. So here we, um, we shoot off one of these blue thingies um, and this means that the whole molecule that is left now gets a positive charge. This blue thingy is also there and then we have two additional electrons. Uh, of course, um, have we get charged and neutral fragments, but we can also get just a single charged uh, fragment. So I hope that's clear. We use an electron beam, we shoot it at the molecule that we want to analyze. The molecule either breaks apart into different subparts and each of these parts either is charged or it's not charged, but because it now has a charge, we can now analyze its mass over charge ratio by looking how long it takes for this molecule to fly from point A to point B, or we can use a sector machine, um, which kind of, which which uses a magnetic field to um, to steer the, but we'll get to that to steer the the, the orbit of the molecule. All right, so hoop. So you want me to draw a fish, a, 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 a beta fish, right? Because Hoop is my, my pet. Um, I got him on my birthday and he's a, a, a fish. So let's go and do some drawing. All right, 
So I didn't practice, so it's gonna be just the same as previous, um, or at least the quality. So let's do a little drawing. So I have my pen and I go to draw and um, we're first going to uh, but draw him when he sees a mirror. All right, so when, when, he, when he sees a mirror, so we then have to have like a little mirror, um, but I'm gonna start off easier because first I'm just gonna draw a little plant because like beta fish love to hide in plants, right? So we, we first need some kind of underwater water plant with some leaves. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. We're going to just draw like a little underwater plant um, just so that we have something for the little fish to hide in. Um, furthermore, since I'm drawing hoop, right, which is my own fish, um, we have a little log on the top of the water where he sleeps in. So let me actually get a water level going as well, right, because we have plants and those plants are more or less underwater. But more important hoop actually has a little log where he sleeps in. Now I don't have any brown color so I'm just going to select a kind of brownish color which doesn't to look too poopy and then of course we will have a log here right so the log has an entrance and then this this log is, is on the water it has like this and of course um, we have to then rid of the water lines just so that we can put those in the back and it also has a little exit here and it has a little exit here right so that's the that's the exits to the log and the log itself is a little bit brownish uh, that we can have a good place for the beta fish to kind of sleep in so this is what we're going to do like Timmy, <laughs> and I don't like having smaller living insects as food. All right, so chat is going wild with my drawing skills. That's always the case, right? Um, so, but he has a little log, right? So now we have the fish because we want to draw the fish. So the fish and ba uh, the f the fish that I have is blue. Um, I do want to have the water level back so that I kind of know where the water is, so that he is underwater, right? Because um, we can't have fishies that are not living underwater. Let's give a little bit of coloring like this, and then we need to have a fish. All right, so a fish is actually relatively easy. Make it neon. All right, let's make it neon, right? So we have a fish, and the fish, of course, has a big, big flaring, because he's flaring, right? So because the fish is really, really angry, um, so we, we just do something like this, which is the first fin. Then we of course have a very very big fin as well at the back and he has this this tail which is like so we're just gonna make a very big tail to the fish and then we're going to make sure that it's like blaring -ish. and then of course he has these little fins on the side as well because he doesn't just have a fin on the top but also a fin on the side and then he has these cute little eyes um, so those are like this and of course the fish is more or less bluish so he's very blue so the eye is a little bit crappy and it's also not really 3d but um, we'll, we'll figure out a way to make it nice and 3d but yeah Hoop is in that sense he's a beautiful beta fish um, and I don't know perhaps I even have a photo of him somewhere so I can show you a photo after I make the drawing on uh, on how cute he looks um, Better than the last one. Wrong shape. That's make it neon. Wrong shape. It's a spade. How do you mean it's a spade? All right. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna draw my little fishy here for you guys so that you can you can see it. All right. And of course, because he lives in an aquarium, we also have to have like an aquarium shape around it, right? And we do need to have a. So he lives in an aquarium. So that's the aquarium on the sides, right? So we're looking into the aquarium. So we need to do a little bit of things like this. Um, the tail fin is spade shaped. What do you mean spade shaped? Like a spade? Like something like this? That looks horrible. <laughs> that looks something that, that we shouldn't be drawing on, on stream. The symbol on the deck of cards, yeah, but but I'm 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 having a hard time getting a uh, ace of spades. 
just gonna gonna make it a little bit more like this and of course the uh the finish on the side need to be there it's actually harder than you think to kind of draw a fish and i actually want him to kind of look at us as well right and, I, and he has a mouth um which well doesn't really look like that but just going to go with it and a little bit of white I'm just gonna make sure that we have a aquarium right and we do have to have a mirror somewhere because otherwise he can't look into the mirror so we would have like a mirror like this and of course if we like this then it's a little bit broken up because of the reflection then we would have something like this because it's a standing mirror and then we will have the fishy as well so we kind of redraw the fishy here but now from kind of a slightly different perspective so that he actually has a tail which looks like that he's angry and he has a little tail here and a little tail there and a little tail there and then of course we need to make him blue again so we are just going to add the really nicely coloring and something like this and like this and then we have to do something like this and of course he's very very angry how do you mean a spade i know how oh that looks that looks bad that's 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 uh, He really likes to show his creative side. I love drawing people. That's just one of these things. Like drawing makes you look at animals and plants and other things in a different way. So it's it's very important. Um, he, let's get a little red plant there as well, just so that we have more plants. Because of course, like they're better fish, so they 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 love to hide in things. And that's one of the nice things, right, about drawing is that if if you if you don't like the drawing that you made so far, you can always have like additional things that you just say, well, no, there's a plant in front because he's hiding, right? So because he's hiding, we don't see the ugly parts like the mouth that I just completely messed up, and we just have him hiding behind like little leaves in the back. So and you know, of course there's more of these, and we need to have also things like gravel on the side. He has a little tree. Um, besides the the log so let me get a slightly different color um, like this one a little bit more brown so he has like a tree log which is this and then we have a log here and the log is sticking about over the water it has a thingy like here as well right so i'm just going to add a little bit of shading to it and of course we have like gravel underneath I think the gravel is more or less black, which you can't really see here. Let's put some black gravelish things in the in the aquarium as well. All right, and this is this is going to be like as good as the previous one. Uh, and it's the the 3D effect is also not really showing as well as I had hoped to. Um, but of course, like because it's an aquarium, there needs to be something in the background as well. So. This one is better. Oh, seriously? Like, I don't think that it looks that much better than the, than the previous one. But uh, this, uh, at least this doesn't really look that angry like the, the gerbil slash guinea pig that I made last week. Uh, something like this. And then, of course, plants because they, 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 they are green, but they have like slightly different colors. So we just add some more colors to it make the leaves a bit little bit bigger because they love leaves and of course like there used to be snails so let's add some green color here and then um, let's do one little snail just so that we have a snail inside of the aquarium so our snails used to be red-ish that doesn't really look like a snail house that much but of course we can actually add like a little snail to it this where we have an eye and then we have of course snails have these things on their heads because they they have their eyes on little sticks so something like that and then of course we just do something like this and then that's about it and of course since this is a thingy and he's hiding behind the green or the, the green thing here right so that should then be also reflected inside of the mirror so we can have something like this, right? So we hide part of the fishy here as well, because he's angry and, and looking at the other one. 
the rabbit bee. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I know that the last one was like, uh, but they had like asking me to draw a guinea pig. Well, I have never drawn a guinea pig before in my life. I actually have never actually tried to draw a better fish either. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, furthermore, of course, he has lambs because like it's a better fish, so they, they need to have lambs. Right? So there needs to be some lights on the top. Because we have these LED light thingies that uh, that he, he loves to kind of hang out under. So those are the LED lights. And then of course we have to have like a, a heating element as well. Um, because heating elements are very important for beta fish because they live in, in tropical environments. So we have this heating element um, here, which is uh, more or less uh, the same as a thermometer. So it also has like this red thingy and then we have of course like little lines on there to see how warm it is. Alright. Isn't this beautiful? So spend some time on it. I hope that uh, this is a this is a nice drawing. So I like it. Um it's uh oh I'm just seeing that the whole thing uh, that looks horrible. <laughs> I, I'm just noticing that the uh, alignment of the thing is a little bit off, so I'm making it a little bit better so that you guys can see it better. So, I hope you're uh, happy with your drawing. Um, I will actually sign the drawing, of course, because that's the most important part. Um, so let me get a white color, and then I'm just going to sign it. I actually want to have a slightly bigger pen, so I'm just going to sign it like this, and it is 2021. All right, Hoop is not amused. I know, I know, I know. Uh, let me actually find you guys a, a picture of Hoop um, so that you can see how badly I messed up. Um, so I'm just going to insert a picture and you guys can see this. So just give me my whole camera roll and then um, there's probably a nice picture of the fish somewhere um, that I recently made. Uh, just so that you guys can see my goldfish and see how badly I messed up. Um, right, so something like this, right? So there he is. It doesn't look a lot like the drawing that I made. Hello? Could be worse, could be worse. Right, the, the tail fin looks a little bit, and he has all kinds of dots, which I actually forgot about, that, that, he's, that he's a spotted fish, right? But it's not too bad, right? And just doing it like this or like this, there's, there's no... Uh... <laughs> I chose the worst picture just to match your drawing. <laughs> like, eh, it's, it's not that bad, it's not that bad, it's not that bad. All right, anyway... Um, I will send you the drawing and then you can uh, enjoy the beautiful drawing of the fish. Good. So let's go back to the terrible. No, it's not ter It's not as bad as this one, right? It has already more stuff. So it's, it's already more wide. I, I don't know. Which, which one do you guys like more? <laughs> like this one or this one? <laughs> At least this one looks a little bit 3D, right? Good. Let's go back to the lecture. Good. So hard ionization. The thing that you have to remember, you use electron bombardment to charge the molecule. The electron bombardment is rough. So the molecule can break up in smaller fragments um, and the smaller fragments may be uncharged. Uh, but the idea is, is that by using the electron beam, hey, you shoot off some of the um, hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms uh, are removed, right? Which means that the resulting molecule is positively charged. Then we also have soft ionization techniques, of course, because we have hard ionization, we also have soft ionization. And this is when you, instead of using an electron beam, shooting the electron beam at your sample, what we do is do soft ionization, which means that we first use a 
inducer gas and this gas is charged. So instead of using electrons which are shot, we first charge gas like argon, neon or xenon. Generally we use inert gases or noble gases um, and this keeps the original molecule whole, right? Because the original molecule merges with the gas or it, it touches the gas and it, you get a, a combination but it is less um, severe than hard ionization techniques and there are several several techniques to achieve this um, has so the um, soft ionization techniques are four different types of ionization techniques one of them is the fast atom bombardment, then we have chemical ionization, so chemical ionization is using an inducer gas, we have electrospray ionization, uh, also called ESI, which is I think at the moment the most common way of doing electron spray ionization, uh, of doing yeah m mass spectrometry. Um, although the matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, MALDI, is also very very common. Um, so MALDI time of flight or ESI time of flight are very common mass spectrometry techniques. Um, by electrospray, I think I have a picture of that. Oh no, first we have the fast atom bombardment. Um, so what we do is we take a beam of high energy atoms. Yeah? So typically we have inert gas like argon and xenon. And what we do is we try to uh, protonate molecules. Yeah? So the M here is the one that we are interested in. So what we do is we take the molecule and we try to add a hydrogen to it. Or we do the deprotonation of molecules, which means that we have the um, gas try and take a hydrogen away from it. So how does it look? Very similar to the hard ionization technique. We have an atom gun, uh, we have the primary atom beam coming out, right? So this is these are charged argon or xenon molecules which are shot into the probe which comes through this little tube and then secondary ions are released. Of course this still like um, the it still fragments the, the, the sample a little bit. It's not as soft that the whole molecule remains intact, um, but the secondary ions, they are then done, uh, they are then going through a focusing lens and then are pulled into the mass spectrometer. Um, but eh, we use argon or xenon and we try to either protonate molecules or we try to deprotonate them, meaning that we, we add a hydrogen molecule or we take a hydrogen molecule away. Just like in the um, hard ionization technique, but here we use an electron beam to shoot off one of the atoms, while here we use um, an inert gas to add or subtract a hydrogen molecule. So we can also use chemical ionization. Um, that means that ions are produced through the collision of uh, collision with ions of a reagent gas that are present in the ion source. So had the difference between fast atom bombardment and chemical ionization is that in this case we use a gas which is a reactive gas. So the um, fast atom bombardment uses a charged inert gas, so a gas which does not react to your sample, while chemical ionization uses a gas which is reacting with your sample, which means that the sample is changed in the process, right? Because we add either a, a, a CH group or we add like an ammonia group or something like that. So chemical ionization is lower energy to compare to electronic ionization, so there is less fragmentation. So the uh, if you would think about it, it keeps the molecules more intact, but because the gas is reacting with the molecule that we are trying to identify, the molecule that we're trying to identify might be um, growing, right? It might react with the gas and now all of a sudden you have a CH2 group attached to the molecule of interest. Electrospray ionization is one of the most commonly used techniques, like I said before. So ions are created using an electrospray. Um, so what we do is we have our solution, right? So we have our uh, molecule of interest, so our sample, which is dissolved in water. Then we have a needle uh, with a very, very small hole. But and so there's a Taylor cone at the end of, of our needle and this, this Taylor cone is then um, attached, so the the, it, the needle has a little hole. This hole and is aimed at a metal plate, and then what what happens is that you have a 5,000 volt uh, 5,000 volt power supply. So you positively charge the needle, you negatively charge the the plate, and because this is water, the molecules 
the molecules of interest will start absorbing these um, um, the, the positive charge, right? Because little droplets will be pulled from the needle through the metal plate. A lot of these droplets, these electrospray droplets, are very big and they will just hit the plate. But because the hole in the plate is so small, tiny individual more or less molecules of the sample will be charged and will go through this little hole in the plate, which then goes through the mass spectrometry. And I, electrospray ionization is very, uh, very useful when you look at, for example, proteins or big molecules, because it's a very soft ionization technique, right? Because the charge is kept by the water and you're making little water droplets with pieces of protein in there, of pieces of metabolites in there, and these little droplets are then pull towards this electric plate in generally in a vacuum so these these the, the the water kind of evaporates and you're left with a charged individual more or less molecule of interest if we want to do uh, another soft ionization technique um, then we are thinking about MALDI MALDI stands for matrix assisted laser desorption and ionization um, so what happens is we we take our um, so we embed our sample in a matrix and a matrix is nothing more than a substance which is holding our sample of interest. Um, so you can think about taking your protein and then putting it into agarose gel or putting it into another type of gel. What you then do is then you have a matrix, uh, then you have a laser, right? So you have a high energy beam of light. This high energy beam of light is shot onto this matrix that you just created with the protein in there and then this releases ions from the sample because the laser has a, a, a massive amount of energy when the laser hits the sample which is in the agarose gel or the other ma or whatever matrix you want to use um, then what happens is that these things are now introduced into a mass filter which is then going into an ion detector so in, in a way it's the same as EC, but instead of using a massive power supply and a little needle, um, what you're doing here is just shooting a laser. So you create a little cloud of, of, of vapor from, from the uh, agarose gel with the protein in there. And this vapor is then pulled into this mass filter and then put into the, um, uh, in the, to the, um, put into the mass spectrometer. So how does mass spectrometry actually work? Well, mass spectrometry is based on two very fundamental laws. So we have the Lorentz force law and we have Newton's law of motion, right? So F is the force applied to the ion, M is the mass of the ion, A is the acceleration, Q is the ionic charge, and E is the electric field, and V times B is the vector cross product of the ion velocity and the magnetic field, right? So this is the theory behind it. So there's two basic laws of physics um, and where one says that the, the force applied to a particle is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the particle. But not just that, we can also say that the force which is applied is the ionic charge multiplied by the electric field plus um, the um, ion velocity and the magnetic field which has been applied. You don't have to know this. I just wanted to mention that these are the two fundamental laws that we use for mass separation. But how does this more or less look? Well, we already saw the sector instrument last time, right? So we have an electric or a magnetic field that affect the path or the velocity of the charged particles in some way. So here we have our beam, right? This beam can be produced by MALDI or by electrospray or by atom bombardment. And But what happens is that we have a a very strong magnet on one side of the machine and this magnet will change the um, force so will change the beam of atom or will beams of ions right so ions which have a small mass over charge are more affected by the magnet than things which have a large mass over charge ratio right if we just say well the charge is one for different molecules and then of course if you have a mass of 45 compared to a mass of 46 and you will be more affected by uh, the magnetic field so and the magnetic field is the Lorentz force law 
So the Lorentz force law is the thing that makes the sector instrument work. So hey, if you have a charged particle which is traveling through a magnetic field, then the influence of the magnetic field on this particle is due to the fact that the more mass it has, the less it is affected. A time of flight machine is just based on Newton's second law, right? So what we do here is we have a source, for example, a Maldi source in this case, because we have a laser which we shoot at a matrix. Then we have something which is called a drift tube. Um, so in this drift tube, the, 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 the beam of charged ions is pulled through the drift tube to make them, to accelerate them to a certain speed, right? So we give them a known push into the drift tube. So have, for example, say we add 50 units of force through this machine. What happens is that there is a detector before the time of, before the molecules enter the time of flight machine, uh, uh, time of flight tube. Inside the time of flight tube, there is a single bound. So, so the, the beam is bound from one plate to another. And then what happens is on the detector, we measure how long it took for the particle to fly from here to there. Right? And because we know the force that we apply to the molecule, we can say that the longer it takes for an ion from start to finish, the longer it takes, the heavier the original ion was. Right? So the time it takes can then be computed and based on the time it takes, we can compute the mass of the original ion. So in the end, what you get is something which looks like this. So if you have cocaine and you do a mass spectrometry of cocaine, in the end, the detector records either the charge induced or the current produced when an ion passes or hits a surface. And it is a scanning procedure for a mass spectrum. So here we have the, so we, we, we shoot our sample. And of course, when we look through the time of flight machine, the smaller molecules or the, the, the molecules which are smaller of, or the molecules which have a bigger charge will arrive earlier than the larger molecules. So here, more or less, we can see the time axis or the mass over charge axis. And here we see the intensity of the uh, detector, right? So what we see is that in the first couple of milliseconds, nothing arrives at the detector, but then we start seeing a peak here at 42. And then again, we see that nothing really arrives at the detector. And then we see that, and so we get these spikes and these spikes are based on which molecule we input it and how the molecule of course fragments because hey, if you, if you use a fragmentation technique, this molecule is chopped up in small pieces. So and when we scan, for a certain time period, what we see is that we get all kinds of peaks and now we can, based on the peaks that we get, we can identify the component that was put into the mass spectrometer. So of course, this spectrum that we get is very dependent on the machine and on the settings of the machine. Right? And we need to have, be able to identify the different fragments. And for this, we use a database and this database is Metlin. So Metlin is the main database for the identification of peaks in a mass spectrometry. This picture is a little bit of a simplification, right? Because here we see it measures 42, but these machines are very, very accurate. So they are accurate to like five, six digits behind the comma. So instead of measuring 42, it can actually tell you that the mass of this of this of this ion was 42.001235 right so they are very very accurate machines and that is why we can exactly identify which compound flew through the mass spectrometer and for this we use the metlin database um, so the metlin database was created in 2003 and it is filled with all kinds of spectra so if a new mass spectrometer is developed, people will take known substances, inject them into the mass spectrometer and see how the spectra look like, right? So it includes over a million molecules ranging from lipids, steroids, plants and bacterial metabolites. So had the metabolites and other chemical entries have been individually analyzed to provide experimental MS-MS data. So this database is nothing more than people using their mass spectrometer, putting in known substances, and then looking to see which peaks come up. The only drawback of the Metlin database is that you have to have an account, which of course is um, perfectly fine. 
um, but it's a free account so you, you don't have to pay for it but you have to register um, to get access to Metlin. So um, how does Metlin look? So if you go to Metlin, hey, you can use it to identify the peaks in a mass spec profile. Um, hey, you have to find the individual fragments. So for each fragment, you can look at the mass over charge ratio that you get, and then you can compare this against known profiles. So if I'm interested in is the substance that I'm looking at cocaine, um, then I can look at the cocaine spectrum and see if my spectrum is similar, or I can just look for all of the individual components and then search for each of these components into the Metlin database. Um, this is, by the way, a screenshot of the old one. So. All right, so do we want to look at Metlin? We can quickly look at it. I don't know if I actually have my account open here um, or if I ever logged in on the new computer that I have. Uh, let me see. Let me just log in for you guys. So, um, uh, username, password, incorrect. All right, then I'm just going to say forgot my password and send me a new one. Uh, right. All right. So it's resetting my password. So uh, just so that we can actually look at it. Um, all right. Nice new randomly generated password. So I can then just log in. I think actually the weird thing here is is that your email address is sensitive to um, hmm. so you just generated a new password for me and then when I try to log in it says that it's incorrect <laughs> all right Let me see what it says. Oh, well, you guys can see this. You're still looking at the PowerPoint. You should tell me in chat if you can't see the, the Firefox thing. Um, Metlin, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Let me see if I can log in. Yeah, that is annoying. Why? Yeah, I know my password is key sensitive, but I'm just copy pasting it. Hmm. All right, then I'm sorry we can't look at Medlin because for some reason I don't get my password reset, but that's uh, that's okay. But um, we will next time. I will make sure that for the next lecture I actually have my account back um, so that we can uh, look at it because during the assignments we're also going to identify a couple of um, mass spectrometry peaks. So. Metlin main database for analyzing mass spectrometry data. All right, so a little bit of, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about metabolic pathways, right? Because metabolites are produced in a pathway, right? So, and there are four very basic principles of metabolic pathways. And so um, if we think about chemical reactions, right? We have a chemical one, um, which through a certain reaction gets produced turned into chemical two, and then through another reaction, chemical number two can be transformed back to chemical number one, right? But the, the metabolic pathways are always irreversible. They always go one way, right? So you go from having sugar to building up a DNA base pair, or you go from having a, a lipid and that lipid is being transformed into a complex lipid with like three lipid groups and these kinds of things, right? So metabolic pathways are highly exergonic, giving the pathway its direction because the pathway needs to run into a certain direction because we are going to, so a plant wants to produce a certain substance. Um, and to produce this substance, we can't have the pathway going uh, two way, right? So the idea is, is that a pathway goes from substance A 
through a whole bunch of steps, through a whole bunch of, of proteins working on this molecule and then producing the molecule that is being produced by the pathway. But since a pathway is irreversible, you can't go from the resulting substance back to the original substance. So if two metabolites can be converted from one to the other, then it means that the pathway from the first to the second must be different than the pathway from the second back to the first. Right, so if we go and we think about, um, for example, sugar going towards a protein, then that is pathway A. Then going from a protein back to a sugar needs to be a different met metabolic pathway. So that is rule number one of metabolic pathways, that metabolic pathways are irreversible. So a substance can travel from A all the way to the result, but from the result you cannot travel back to A, via the same pathway. So you can of course travel back, but then that has to go via a different pathway. So the second principle of metabolic pathways is that there has to be a first committed step, right? So when we have a substance, then there has to be a step because hey, like chemical reactions, if you think about a chemical reaction where you have a uh, enzyme working on a substance, turning substance A into substance B, then in all of these pathways, right, if you have very, if you have like 10 or 20 different steps, and then most of the reactions in a metabolic pathway are very close to equilibrium, meaning that and the, the substance is being transformed, um, but then it automatically transforms back because the chemical structures of them are very similar. So every pathway needs to have a step where it commits the intermediate it produces to continue down that pathway. So there is a, in every pathway, a linear pathway, if we're talking about a linear pathway, there is a step at which the, um, the, the protein transforms the molecule in such a way that it cannot automatically transform back by using a water molecule or a, or a hydrogen or something like that, right? Because generally chemical reactions are more or less an equilibrium, so hey, depending on the temperature or depending on other conditions, the equilibrium can shift. But in a pathway, this is not the case. There is, at a certain point in the pathway, there is a protein. This protein transforms a substance into another substance and this other substance that is being produced is different from the original, so different from the original that it cannot be transformed back unless another protein acts on it. So every metabolic pathway has a first committed step. And then once this step is done, the molecule, the, the original molecule needs to continue traveling along the, on, along the pathway to reach the end product. The fourth principle of metabolic pathways is that all metabolic pathways are regulated. The control of the metabolic flux or metabolites through a pathway is accomplished by regulating the rate determining step of the pathway, which is often the first committed step of the pathway. Right, so the, the first step in, oh, we have this sugar and we're going to produce a, a DNA molecule, right? So there is, at a certain point, there is a step which commits this sugar to go and be a DNA molecule and not something else. And this step is highly regulated because you can't have unbridled production of, of DNA molecules. Um, and you, you need to have a... Um, um, a regulation and this regulation or this rate determining step is often the first committed step of the pathway. The fourth principle is that metabolic pathways in eukaryotic cells occur in very specific cellular locations. Like a, a cell is a very complex organ, or is a very complex thing in itself. It's not a little fat bubble filled with water and stuff just floating around, right? A, a eukaryotic cell has a nucleus, we have mitochondria, we have lysosomes, we have um, the endoplasmatic reticulum, we have all kinds of different organelles and these organelles are there to, um, to aid and to make it possible for certain chemical processes to take place. Right, so eukaryotes use organelles to compartmentalize metabolic pathways, allowing different metabolic pathways to occur in specific locations. Not allowing, but the reason for these metabolic pathways to be there is because they need something. Right, if you are in the lysosome, then you are in a highly acidic environment and that allows for chemical reactions to take place, which need to be taking place in a highly acidic environment. 
while some other things need to be happening in the endoplasmatic reticulum because the conditions there are right for that part of the pathway. Right? So the four basic principles. The first one is that if you go from A to B, or if you go from 1 to 2, then you go via A, so pathway A, but if you go from 2 to 1, you have to have another pathway. So a pathway only works in one direction. Not only that, once a molecule is being committed to a pathway, there is a committing step which means that after this step the molecule can't go back in the pathway or be used for anything else. This step, this first step is highly regulated because you can't just start producing chemicals um, and besides that these pathways always occur in very specific cellular locations. So those are the four basic principles of metabolic pathways. So for everything or for every theory that you come up with regarding metabolites and proteins and, and, and enzymes, these four pathways, uh, pathway rules need to, um, need to be true. So if we look at the different metabolic organelles in the eukaryotic cells, there are a lot, right? I already said that we have things like the mitochondria, where things like the citric acid cycle or the oxidative phosphorylation take place, but also the amino acid catabolism, right? So we remember anabolism and catabolism, right? So catabolism is the breaking down of uh, amino acids. We have the cytosol, so that is the, well, it's not really an organelle, right? Because the cytosol is everything which is not in an organelle um, and that is where glycolysis takes place but we also have things like gluconeogenase right so where where glucose is made from um, other molecules we have the nucleus where metabolic pathways like DNA replication, RNA transcription and RNA processing take place we have the lysosome where we have the enzymatic degradation uh, enzymatic digestion and degradation of cellular components, right? So if the cell wants to break something down, this happens in the lysosome. We have the Golgi apparatus where post-translational modifications of membrane and proteins which are secreted are done. We have the rough, rough endoplasmatic reticulum where the synthesis of membrane bound or secreted proteins take place, right? So, so we first have um, so if you want to make a protein which is going into the cell wall then this is first brought into the endoplasmatic reticulum so here we have the nucleus then we have the rough endoplasmatic reticulum and then afterwards if this molecule still needs to be modified it is brought to the Golgi apparatus um, which is located uh, here Golgi body we have the smooth endoplasmatic reticulum, which is where lipids and steroids are synthesized. And we have the peroxisomes, where amino acid oxidases and catalysis glycosylative implants take place. Right, So peroxisomes are where highly oxidative reactions take place. Um, so peroxisomes are relatively dangerous for a cell, because like a peroxisome, it contains hydrogen peroxide so anything that you break in there is directly oxidized so hey, there's there, there, it's kind of burning in the cell so there's an, 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 an organelle um, which allows the cell to burn all kinds of um, amino acids and other things if it if it needs to which is very similar to the lysosome but the lysosome works via enzyme enzymatic digestion while the peroxisome is a chemical digestion different cellular components. Good, so um, I hope that that's clear that like hey, within a cell there is a very high degree of where everything takes place. These all things are very regulated. Some things can only take place at certain parts in the cells and this is of course because a cell needs a very tight control over what happens within and which items are produced. All right, I will take a short break, another 10 minutes, and then I think we should finish like 15, 20 minutes later. Um, so I'll take a break until 3.15, and then I hope that we finish by like 3.45 at the maximum, unless I still have to do a drawing somewhere, because if I still need to do another drawing today, then that's fine. I like drawing, um, but that will then add like a couple of minutes more to the lecture. Um, so I just want to, um, after the after the break, um, I just want to discuss some important pathways, um, and we will be starting with glycolysis.
So for now, thank you for watching and I will see you guys in 10 minutes. If you're watching it on YouTube, I will see you later. So, see you later.